before the tanks in Tiananmen, before the tragedy in Tehran. Students in the USA spoke out and were killed in Kent State, Ohio. It is 1970. The American war in Southeast Asia is spreading from Vietnam to Cambodia. The areas in which these attacks will be launched are completely occupied and controlled by North Vietnamese forces. Our purpose is not to occupy the areas. So we had those two reasons to protest, the invasion of Cambodia and the uh, invasion of our campus by the National Guard. I had a pretty big philosophy about the use of tear gas. Uh, I don't know how many rounds we fired, somewhere between two and 400 rounds that day. Here were kids who had been brought up to believe that America was different because that we had freedom of speech. Students did not think it conceivable that the rifles that the guardsmen were carrying had bullets in them. And then we turned and opened fire, and I said to myself, oh my God, they're going to shoot. 13 seconds. Some 60 bullets, four dead in Ohio. Four decades ago this spring, in May 1970, public anger against the war in Vietnam had reached a boiling point. Ohio's Kent State wasn't the most radical of universities, but a tragic turn of events on this campus would test the limits of dissent in American democracy and show how public outrage could help end a war. Kent is calm. Forty years ago, there was an eruption of protest and vandalism after a stunning announcement by the American president, Richard Nixon. Tonight, American and South Vietnamese units will attack the headquarters for the entire communist military operation in South Vietnam. He was going to pursue the North Vietnamese enemy from Vietnam into Cambodia. After confrontations between the local police and students, the Ohio governor sent in soldiers under his command, the National Guard, and the stage was set. Universities, I think throughout the world, uh, strive for a marketplace of ideas, and that marketplace was shut down on May 4th, 1970. Kent State Professor Laura Davis teaches a class about the events on campus four decades ago. He was so affected by her tragedy in particular. She and herself survived them as a student. A kind of Nixon had said when he was elected in 68 that he had a secret plan to end the war. And then in the year prior to May 4th, he unveiled his plan. He had a plan of Vietnamization. He was going to gradually draw down the troops in Vietnam and then train the South Vietnamese Army and turn over the war effort to the South Vietnamese. So Nixon's Cambodia announcement came as a slap in the face. That was really uh, Nixon, I think, uh, daring our generation to finally take a stand to stop the war, and we did that. Uh, here in Kent, Ohio, and across the country, we began to protest more vigorously. The anti-war protests grew as parents and children understood each other less and less in a growing generation gap. You know, the difference in the values of the two generations. You know, the parents' generation, they were a generation that believed that children were to be obedient. And children, you know, were in this culture, their own culture, where the value was to question everything to fi figure out your own values. And it was a time of great cultural change. A lot of people started letting their hair grow long, uh, experimenting with uh, maybe marijuana and listening to a lot of rock music and questioning authority, questioning our parents and the older generation. And questioning the war. On campus, they're setting fire in the buildings. After Nixon's Cambodia announcement, students burned the officer training building on the Kent campus a hated symbol for the many young men who could be forced to fight. The driving force of the anti-war movement in the Vietnam era was the draft. And in those days, everybody was eligible and had to deal with the draft. And of course, 
uh, by that I mean men. And of course, then that affected uh, sisters and mothers and, and whole families. The governor of Ohio came to Kent and talked tough, very tough. We are going to eradicate the problem. We're not going to treat the symptoms. And these people just move from one campus to the other and terrorize a the community. They're worse than the brown shirt and the communist element and also the night riders and the vigilantes. They're the worst type of people that we harbor in America. And I want to say this, they're not going to take over a campus. It was the National Guard that was going to take over the Kent State campus. The governor's soldiers imposed a curfew. They flew helicopters over the university and even bayoneted a few unruly students. By Monday, the students were angry at more than the war. They wanted to protest against the presence of soldiers in their place of learning. Students were very aware of that they were practicing their right to assembly and freedom of speech. Alan Canfora was one of them. What is this place? This is where the May 4th rally started at 12 o'clock noon in 1970. Students were ringing this bell. And this was gathering a large crowd. This was a traditional area where people would gather for rallies back at that time against the war. Jeffrey Miller was another. Jeffrey was a very peaceful young man. He was a poet. He wrote anti-war poetry while he was in high school. He was very much against the war in Vietnam. His mother remembers their last phone call right before the demonstration. I said, you know, do you think that's going to do any good? He says, I don't know. He said, but I feel, you know, sometimes you, you, you just have to do these things. And he said, don't worry about it. He said, uh, I might get arrested, but I'm not going to get my head broken. A soldier's bullet would put Dean Kaler in a wheelchair for life. But he, too, didn't feel threatened that day. I went to, like I said, watch what was happening because I'd never seen an anti-war demonstration to lend my voice to uh, opposition to the invasion of Cambodia, and three, to find out what was the, the timeline here, what was the schedule, uh, how long were the National Guard going to be on campus. But the leaders of the National Guard were on edge. What I seen missing was the lack of any real positive control by the leaders of the demonstrators. And I recognized that immediately as, as, a, as a dangerous omen. The soldiers decided to disperse the students. This uh, really amused the crowd and created a situation where they started jeering and cheering the National Guard, chanting anti-war slogans at them, telling them, you know, pigs off campus and all the other ones that went along with it. And they went back, the National Guard did, and the campus police, you could see them putting on their gas masks and loading up their rifles and putting their bayonets on the end of them. You have the guard against the students, but the students are essentially unarmed. Students are only armed with their voices. There were a few rocks being thrown, but it was mainly shouting and, and gesturing against soldiers. They went back. You could see them then putting their tear gas canisters and their grenade launchers, and all of a sudden, bang, you hear all these pops and all these eight or ten tear gas canisters come flying through the air at us. Some of the soldiers would later say they felt confused. There was constant yelling. Uh, sometimes they'd throw things. Uh, and then talking among themselves and people trying to lead them in some way to do something. I don't know what it was. Most Kent State students didn't live on campus and so had nowhere to go between classes. But the soldiers still tried to drive them away. John Philo was a student photographer at the time who won a Pulitzer Prize for his work that day. He shot this David and Goliath scene. You know, this is the lone student against this army, literally an army. And there was a rifle on the squad pointing the rifles at him. And I said, yeah, this is, I'm looking around, I'm like, this is the best picture I've ever taken. Alan Canfora was that student. While I waved that black flag and I looked at those guardsmen aiming those guns in my direction, I thought at that moment that my life was in danger. I thought I could be killed. But at that time, only 10 days after I attended my friend's funeral, after he was killed in Vietnam, I thought to myself, if I have to risk my life to make my most powerful statement against this war in Vietnam, I'm going to do that. They went to a practice field, um, were there for about 10 minutes, and um, I saw them reappear into my line of vision and, and uh, marching back in the direction they had come from. So I was thinking to myself that they uh, must be going back where they 
came from. The soldiers did start back, marching slowly up a hill. But it was no retreat. About a dozen from Troop G stopped, turned, raised their weapons, aimed, and they began to shoot. 67 gunshots fired down the hillside. They wounded four of us on the hillside. I didn't think. I just started screaming. Um, they're shooting their guns. Kind of zigged and zagged, and I saw this tree, and I ducked behind the tree, and I knelt here. And just as I knelt, wham, I felt the bullet enter in through the front of my wrist, and it came out the side. Next thing I know, I got shot. Uh, it felt like a bee sting blow my left shoulder blade and hit my spinal cord instantaneously. And I felt a tingling sensation through my legs. And then uh, it got real tight, and they relaxed. And I knew immediately then that I had a spinal cord injury. When I realized it was live ammunition, I, 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 I tried to flee, but then saw the body of uh, Jeffrey Miller. I saw the girl run up to him, kneel down beside him, and I knew I was running out of film in that particular role uh, in that camera. And I was having this intense debate whether to shoot this picture or not when she let out with a scream and you know, the debate was over. There was uh, my geology professor, he was actually a geology professor that everybody loved, and he was pacing back and forth in front of the students. I am begging you right now, if you don't disperse right now, they're going to move in and there can only be a slaughter. Would you please listen to me? Jesus Christ, I don't want to be a part of this. Please. Elaine Holstein remembers how her boyfriend, Artie, walked in just as she got the news. I called Jeff's apartment. And it rang and rang for quite a while. And then some kid picked up one of his roommates, and I said, let me talk to Jeff. He said, Jeff's dead. And with that, Artie walked in. And, uh, you know, uh, he, he grabbed the phone because I, I just thought, I, 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 I cannot survive this. It, it didn't seem possible. I heard Artie asking, you know, making, uh, he, he was wearing a little uh, ring with a peace symbol. They were trying to identify, make sure that this was Jeff, and it was. Years later, John Philo met the woman in his picture, Mary Ann Vecchio, a 14-year-old runaway she was protesting against the war. She told him how she was feeling when he snapped his famous picture. She wanted to help, and there's nothing she could do. And then when she realized there was nothing she could do to help, the frustration she just had with a scream. I think the young people in particular in America said, we cannot stand for this. That young woman, Mary Vecchio, is screaming out for all of us. I started eventually seeing John Farlow's picture, and each time it was like darts going into my head. And eventually I had to sort of steal myself that this is going to happen. Um, wherever I turn, I'm going to see that picture. I decided that this is how Jeff looked when he was asleep, and that got me through it. Some of the soldiers would later say they felt afraid for their lives. But the vast majority of their shots went far away out into the distant parking lot, hundreds of feet away, and that's where they killed four and wounded four. So the majority of the students that were shot, that were killed and wounded, were far away, hundreds of feet away in the distant parking lot, because that's where the most radical and uh, vocal anti-war students had gathered. The distances speak for themselves. 80 meters away, 20-year-old Jeffrey Miller fell. He was protesting against the war. 105 meters away fell Allison Krause, a student also demonstrating against the war. 116 meters away fell Bill Schroeder, 19. Not a demonstrator, he was returning to class. And 119 meters away fell Sandra Scheuer, age 20, also just a student, heading to class. As the ambulances arrived, the guardsmen mostly held their ground. I took a squad forward to attempt to see if somebody was alive that we could help. Uh, they weren't. I called for the ambulances right away and, uh, and then withdrew. 
And the only thing they did to the body of Jeffrey Miller was put the boot under him and roll him over. If you want to call that help, I, not help in my book, I'm sorry. In the following days, the Kent State students encountered the anger of the older generation and of war supporters. I got nasty letters. The uh, first card I opened up when I was in the intensive care unit was, Dear Communist Hippie Radical, I hope by the time you read this you are dead. That was the first line. To a place like Kent State, Laura Davis remembers going home, of, feeling very alone, and then meeting her father. And he said to me, they should have shot all of them. And I said to him, well, don't you know then that one of those people would have been me? And he passed into the back room. Under pressure, President Nixon ordered an investigation. Its conclusion found that the killings were unwarranted, unnecessary, and inexcusable. The victims and their families had to fight in Ohio courts for nine years before reaching a meager settlement, and no one went to jail. That was the second worst day of my life because, the, you know, the first, of course, was the day he was killed. This was like it happened all over again. You know, we had a sign then that we would bring no further suits. This was it. We were signing away any rights. And um, the, set, uh, the, the words in the statement were not what I wanted particularly, but it, it was something. And uh, the cash, uh, I don't know if you know the cash uh, agreements, each, um, each dead student was worth $15,000. After years of investigations and trials, it was never established why a small group of soldiers all at once turned to shoot. It's true. The central mystery of May 4, 1970 at Kent State remains this question. Why did the National Guard fire? Was there an order to fire? It's hard to understand how all the guardsmen would turn at once and, and fire. Well, I, don't, I don't think any order to fire was given. I, I, have no, I have no information that would indicate that in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> I don't believe that. I believe there had to be some sort of prearranged signal. Why would they suddenly turn in unison? They were, they were heading away. It was breaking up. Everybody thought it was over. They turned, they crouched, and they shot into the crowd. The commanding officers on the scene deny giving an order, and they shift the blame away from the officers onto the triggerman. They say that the individual dozen triggermen simultaneously thought that their lives were in danger, so they all stopped, turned, raised their weapons, began to shoot, and continued to shoot for 13 seconds, all of their own individual choice. Elaine Holstein thinks with all the years gone by, the truth has become what the aging former soldiers need it to be. You know, you can tell yourself something. There's uh, this theory of cognitive dissonance or something, okay, where uh, you justify what you did. You can't take the guilt. You know, what are you going to say? I killed a bunch of teenagers for nothing. Uh, they have to really justify it to go on with their lives. I understand that. But there's no mystery about the immediate consequences of the Kent State killings. That same week, the first and only nationwide student strike in U.S. history, with four million participating. We will win and put an end to this war. Then, a march on Washington and political change. That clearly had a powerful impact on the Congress. They started seriously to end the war in Vietnam. They started cutting off the funding. They rescinded the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which was the reason for the war in Vietnam, and they started seriously forcing Nixon to bring the troops home. Kent State was the day the war came home. The general public just began to talk about the war and all the problems with it uh, because of, of May 4th. The, the May 4th killings stimulated the discussion about the war coming home to America. One, two, three, four. We don't want your racist war. Forty years after the Kent State protests against the war in Vietnam, the United States is fighting two new wars. The killing four decades ago of the Ohio students remains an inspiration, even if the anti-war movement has lost a lot of steam. You know, back then they were doing it for Vietnam. Today we're doing it for Iraq and Afghanistan. It, you know, all we can say to them is that it lives on. You know, the spirit lives on and. The agenda, our agenda lives on versus their agenda. Our ability to, to stand up on, on campuses all over the country today, um, even if we don't, we don't know about it consciously, intrinsically, it's what our mass movement is built on. But for those who once protested against the American presence in Vietnam, 
the anti-war movement now faces a challenge, people's fear. And I think if it hadn't been for 9-11, there would be a lot more anti-war activity now than there is. But 9-11 put people like Obama, or any president, in a position where they can say, to say two things. Um, trust me, to, I'll protect you. Don't, don't question what I'm doing, I'll protect you. And people are still scared enough to go for that. And for those who lived through the Kent State killings, there is lingering anger at the country's leaders at the time. I mean, the assault was by the leaders of our country who were trying to oppress a group of people who were saying, wait a second, you taught us these values. You taught us these morals. You taught us these history lessons. You taught us that we have to participate in this process. We're trying, but you keep gunning us down. It was such a, a, a black mark against the country, in my mind, that here were kids who had been brought up to believe that America was different because that we had freedom of speech, that you're allowed to voice opposition to a government policy, and you could do this without worrying about getting killed. And this wasn't true in other countries. But the Kent State tragedy also provides lessons for today. And I think the debate continues. Uh, we are a highly armed society which I think is one of our weaknesses. And we need to continue to debate the amount of force that's used against us. For Elaine Holstein, the pain of her son Jeff's death takes on a new meaning as history moves on and other students elsewhere in the world speak out. To me, I, the scene I remember is Tiananmen Square and seeing those students and thinking how wonderful that they will dare to do that. They know they're risking their lives. It took her years before she could make the pilgrimage to Kent. I saw the spot where Jeff was killed. Um, I've been there a number of times since. Uh, it's always a very emotional experience. But th this, you know, here it is 40 years later. It doesn't go away. I don't want it to go away. <laughs>